Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 20 of Knittings and Sewings. We're sitting over here for a change, and Wally is wanting to say hi. He has his little Chiefs Mahomes jersey on and wanted to say go Chiefs. <laughs> so thanks for joining us here, Wally. <laughs> So I wanted to welcome you back to episode 20 of Knittings and Sewings, where we talk about all things knitting, sewing, spinning, weaving, uh, crochet, just a variety of fibery things. And while we're at it, I wanted to show you my new mug I just got from Bob. Well, it's, there's a little bit of a glare, so it's hard to see. But we'll show you a picture later. This is a darling little mug he got me commemorating. Uh, we're almost at one year of our Knittings and Sewings podcast, which we started at the end of December, the very end of December last year. So we're getting close to our one-year anniversary. And so I love this mug. And today I am drinking Stash's Cinnamon Vanilla Tea. It's a fall favorite of mine. So let's start by talking about the vest that I am wearing. That tea is just yummy. It's one of my favorite fall, fall flavors. I love stashed teas. But this particular vest is one that I wear a lot when it comes to fall. Uh, it's just an iconic fall vest. I love vests, first of all, uh, all times of the year. I'm a vest person. So this particular one, though, is not made from a pattern. It was hand-woven by, by me a few years ago, uh, I think three or four years ago. And I also sewed it myself, and it is one of my own design. So I wanted to show you all sides of it here, and we'll put up a picture too to give you a little bit more of close-ups of certain parts of it that might be of interest. Uh, I wanted to talk about this because, quite frankly, we haven't spoken much about weaving for a while, and I haven't been doing much weaving this winter, but I'm getting, or this fall, but I'm getting ready to do some weaving in the winter. So I wanted to show you this and tell you a little bit about how it came about, because some of you may be interested in the future in, uh, if you do any weaving, and trying to do some handmade garments. And it doesn't take a lot of sewing ability to do this, in all honesty, because I am not, even though I call this podcast Knittings and Sewings, I am not a very advanced sewer. I would say, uh, I started in 2017 to be able to sew some of my hand-woven garments, but I would say I am a beginning to intermediate at most sewist. And so because of that, uh, if I can do it, I know you can do it. If you have any interest in turning either your rigid heddle woven garments or your uh, floor loom woven, any cloth that you have made, uh, you can turn it into a garment, even if you only have like a 13-inch panel. You can combine a couple of those panels and create particularly a vest. is an easy thing to do. So I wanted to start by telling you quickly how I did this, because I didn't have a pattern. But if you look here on the mannequin, Millie, you can see that she's wearing a white kind of fleecy vest that I purchased from a thrift store several years ago. And I just want to show you that is just a simple zippered vest. And it happens to fit me well. It's one that does fit me. Um, and I've worn it a lot in several different winters. And so what I did was to start off with this simple vest and make pattern pieces out of each part. So it's composed of, if you look, it has each side of the side piece. And then it has a little collar. And in the back, it is also composed of two See in the middle, it's, it, there's a seam going down the middle. So this was an ideal vest to use as a pattern. But even if you just have a vest that is all one piece in the back, that's okay because you can just divide it in half. But the point is, because I have uh, was making this on my baby wolf loom, um, my, ch my chest and back are more than a little more than 40 inches. So... Um, I need a little bit more than that, like maybe 20, I give myself 23 inches on each side. So 23 for this side, 23 for this, and then for the back, again, dividing it up in half. So because of the size of my loom, I want to make it in four different pieces. 
big pieces. And then I also added a collar that we'll talk about in a moment. But that's what I used as a basic just to take some peplon, that stuff you can buy at the fabric store that you can make pattern pieces out of, or you can use a sheet as a pattern piece as well. I've done that before. But I first started off by making four basic pattern pieces for the front. And actually, I used one pattern piece for the front and just turned it around on the other side. But you could make two for the front, two for the back, and then if you want to have a little collar, you can do that as well. This is just your most simple, basic little vest. And if you take one that already fits you, it makes it work, you know, a lot easier because you're going to know that it pretty much is going to fit. Then what I did, I, so I made this fabric, and I'm going to have Bob put up a picture of the whole piece of fabric. I was using, in this vest design, I was using all kinds of different stash yarns I had in my weaving stash and some of it from my yarn stash and so what I did as you can see this side is more orange and this side is more caramely brown and there are various colors within this jacket and so what I was doing was laying the fabric out and I happened to use uh, my living room floor with a mat down as my basic cutting area because I don't have a formal cutting table but I put the pieces down, pinned them down on the, on the fabric that I had made, this rust fabric. And I had varying shades of, like I said, orange, rust, toffee color. And it was all on one long, long, narrow piece of fabric. And then I put my pattern pieces on there, pinned them on, cut them out. And then when I had all the pieces cut out, I went to Millie, my mannequin here. And I pinned them onto the mannequin and how they would work. And then eventually I sewed the side seams. You know, I pinned it to shut to putting the right sides together, obviously. Pinned it so that as I it would be if I sewed it. Sewed the basic seams together. So I only had I had the shoulder seam for the backs and I had the side seams. Those were the basic seams. And I sewed those pieces together. You know, obviously then leaving the armhole here. And so the collar I later added, and I also add a little binding around the armholes from, again, a piece of this fabric that I had. And one thing I mentioned about this fabric that I particularly liked is that I cut up little pieces of yarn and fabric that I had left over in my stash. At various times I keep a little bit a little container of my leftover yarns and fabrics to use as a mismatch, mismatch for the art yarn, to make a kind of an art yarn effect. So I'm going to bring this closer. So I wanted to just show you uh, a little bit of a close-up here of how this fabric is composed of little add-ins. It's what I call add-ins. It's a mismatch of, my mismatch, I mean a collection of little pieces. Some of this is from fabric. I cut up tiny shards of fabric from previous projects. Some of it is novelty yarn. You see here, all kinds of novelty yarn. And if you look at the buttons, this is something I really love. This, these buttons are mismatched. When I say mismatched, I mean they're just totally different buttons that were actually from my grandmother Fern's collection. And I was very proud and happy to be able to include some of her special buttons. And I didn't want them to match. My stuff is not matchy-matchy. It's very asymmetrical and avant-garde. That's my style. And so this is just to show you. And then up close again, we have the binding I used. Took a little bit of pieces of leftover fabric from this fabric and just pinned it carefully on the sleeves so I wouldn't have raw sleeves and sewed that down. That was a later step. But you can get an idea. And then one more thing I want to note close up is the collar. This was a piece where I actually had a little bit of shrinkage. You may see here on the little ruffling it's doing in there at the collar. That was a piece where I had some fabric that was cotton and some that was wool. And there may have been a fabric differential uh, so that when it was washed or finished, it did a little puckering there. Well, I liked that effect. It looked to me like I had purposely made a ruffle 
And so who would know that that was really an accident in terms of the fabric, fabric shrinkage? I turned it into an art statement. I don't seam carefully, and I don't usually use linings. So here are my seams. They're pretty rough right here. Um, but the seams that I made, now some of you probably would make a lining, and that might be a good idea. But I have my basic seams that are in this are the side seam, the back seam, and side seam here too, obviously. And then I added in the collar and the little binding for the sleeves. And then the collar, these are triangle shapes. But I hope this gave you some insight into my fall vest. I'm going to be making another vest here soon, as I've told you before, the Vincent Van Gogh is finally ready to uh, beam on that fabric. And so hopefully I will be having that later in the winter to share with you. But I did want to share this one while fall is still here and the fall leaves are falling. And uh, soon I'm going to be moving into more wintry wear. The backdrop behind me is a quilt because we're getting ready to soon be going into winter. And I'm not a quilter myself. So uh, behind me, though, I have a backdrop of a quilt that my great aunt Marilyn made for me some years ago. She made each one of us uh, girls uh, a quilt with colors she felt that we would uh, like and, uh, you know, a design that was unique for each of, the, of myself and my cousins. So anyway, I really enjoy having that backdrop behind me, and I wanted to point that out. I've kept it as nice as I can for many, many years. And some of you who are quilters may be able to identify what quilt pattern that is. Um, if not, I'll try to find out and put it in the show notes. But anyway, I'm very happy to have her beautiful quilt as a backdrop today. Now, I want to talk about uh, first things first today. I have started a new project. And last time, as you know, I had abandoned, at least temporarily, if not permanently, my geo gradient shawl pattern um, that Stephen West uh, did this year, and I just uh, still am not feeling the love for it. So it may stay permanently in the uh, cast aside uh, column. <laughs> but I wanted to show you what I've started since. In order to make myself feel a little bit better, I wanted more of an instant gratification project. And so I started a sweater that I have been wanting to make for the past three or four years. It's called the Ranunculus. And I think the, it's by Midori, uh, I don't know her, Hiroshi, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I will put a show note up and a note of what it is. But everyone has heard of it. It's the Ranunculus. And it's one of the most, it's one of the most uh, patterns that is most made and on all of Ravelry. It's one of the most popular, and it's been around for several years. Um, but I decided to do the higher neck version because I don't like things real low on my shoulders or neck. I like things to be up close around my neck. And so this is one I decided to uh, do a tubular cast on, like she has in the pattern. And then I uh, started in on it. And all of the sizes start with a certain number of stitches at the beginning. And then they expand out. And you don't worry about the sizing. Everyone has the same beginning yoke part. And you don't worry about the sizing until you get to ready to divide for the arms. So at this point, I'm still on the yoke. I've got some really good progress. And you're probably seeing some little orange yarns in there. Those are my lifelines because I'm putting lifelines in every few rows or every section. And uh, that way, if I do make a mistake, I can go back to that earlier section. I really am a believer in lifelines. So this is the first time I've ever made this pattern. I really love it. And I decided not to buy extra yarn for this because I just have been spending money on yarn like I told you before. So I pulled this out of my deep stash. I have very little yarn left in my stash. I have some fiber, and this is kind of, I don't know how it's going to show up on camera, but it's kind of like a, uh, a purpley, muted purple, almost aubergine, not quite. It's more of on the purple side than the brown. 
And it is called Joe Sharp Silk Road Aaron Tweed. And it won't show here probably, but it does have a slight tweed to it. I'm always a fan of tweed. So I ran upon, in my deep stash, as I was cleaning out my closet, I ran upon nine of these little small skeins. And I think they're around maybe 109 yards each, something like that. The uh, color is Jewel. And it's composed of mostly 85% wool, 10% silk, and 5% cashmere. And in each of these, it's 104 yards. So if I have nine of these, you know, I have at least 900 yards. Uh, and so I hopefully have enough to make the ranunculus. I don't know if I'm going to have enough for the long sleeves or if I'm going to do a shorter sleeve version. But this is more of, I would say that this, this yarn is probably a light worsted or maybe a heavy sport weight, possibly a heavy DK or sport weight. But I think it's more of a light worsted. And I am using myself a size 9 needle. I took my little gauge swatch. And I started off, let's see if I can find what I started with. Oh, yeah, here it is. Just to let you know, I started off with a very small yarn, I, I mean needle here. I used the uh, Destiny Circulars by Lantern Moon. These are ones I've had in my stash for a long time. But they're even a little bit less than 16 inches. So they're very, very small, which makes it ideal for starting the very beginning neck section if you're doing the tightest neck. And I did put the lifelines in so I could try this on. Uh, and I've tried it on a couple of times to make sure that it is going to fit me. And again, I'm just down now. I'm in section three, I think it is. Let's check. Oh, no. I don't have, I don't have the pattern here. But I'm in the section that has the yoke. I think it's section three. Um, and I'm soon going to be done with that and moving on to the other part where you divide for the body. I believe I'm going to make a size three. This is a very oversized sweater. And depending on your yarn you're using, this sweater can look totally different on different people with different yarn. So I'm aiming for a size three, which is a fairly large size, but there's a whole huge size range. So I'm going to just be trying it on with a lifeline to see if the three is going to be the size I'll go with. Um, I want mine to be oversized. I don't want it to be tight, but I also don't want it to swim on me. I, I know some of the people wear them very loose, very, very loose. And it's a certain style in Japan, I think, from what I've heard, that is meant to be that way. The style is meant to be worn extremely loose and very comfy, but I don't want mine swimming. I would like it to be fairly, you know, some ease, but not swimming on me. So we'll see if I can accomplish that. But so far, I've only done this, been working on this for a week. And I know that seems like, for some of you, you could be halfway done with the sweater. But for me, working on it for a week and getting this far is pretty good. I, I felt very content and happy with my progress. And it gave me back a little bit of the confidence that I was beginning to really, you know, when you have a project that fails so utterly, uh, as my teal gradient did, and you get your hopes all up about it turning out well, and I told many of you how excited I was. Uh, when you have a project fail like that, or a big oops, as I've said in a previous podcast, when you have those kind of failures, it can make you kind of feel down on yourself about, you know, I don't know, it just makes me feel a little bit down. And so having this easy project that has been so successful for so many people really gave me that boost of confidence back that I needed again to pick myself up and, and get back on the, on the saddle again uh, with my crafting. So that's what I chose to do, and I'm really going to enjoy that sweater, I believe. It's a pleasure working with it, and it brought back that love of making that I always encourage you guys to do what, you know, make what you love and wear what you make. So this is bringing back that love of making once again, and I'm really, really happy with it. Now we're going to talk about some more ideas for Christmas gift giving that I've been sharing with you in the past couple of podcasts, and we'll continue through Christmas, talking about some simple, great gift ideas that you might want to try for those you love. 
Last time we talked about the eyeglass cases, that would be an episode, if you're interested in the eyeglass case episode, that would be episode 19. And in episode 18, we talked about the dryer balls. And so I hope that you have been uh, enjoying some of the ideas and maybe you have already tried a couple of those things. Let me know if you've tried either one of those other projects and how they turned out. And now I'm going to give you my next idea, which is fingerless mitts. This is one of my very favorite things to give to people. Um, they're something everybody wears once the weather turns. And uh, I have just now started one of the ones that is my favorite, which is the main morning mitts. And I don't know if you can see them very well up close. I have just started the first one. So I'm doing uh, the beginning part. It starts from the top down. Uh, from the wrist, and you start with some ribbing. This is a, a pattern that is free by Clara Parks, and you can get it on Ravelry or even, I think, in general on the internet. Uh, it's free for anyone who wants to make it. But uh, I do think you would enjoy her pattern. It starts off with ribbing that is just a simple three knits with one pearl ribbing that goes for about four inches, and then you start working on the gusset, which is the part, you know, your thumb. And then you go on up for straight knitting again for the, um, for the other part of the hand. So I think it's about a total of eight inches. But anyway, this is a very simple to make main morning mitts. And I will put up a picture of how they look, how Clara, you know, the pattern picture. But this is one I highly recommend. I've made these many, many times, both for myself and for my daughter and for friends, and uh, haven't made this pattern in a few years, but it's definitely a winner. You use three double pointed needles for the actual knitting, and then a fourth one for knitting off the three needles. And I like to have little uh, needle stoppers at the end, so if I walk away, I don't lose the needles off the needle. But I like to use double pointed needles. If you are a magic loop girl or guy, then you can certainly use the magic loop as well. But this is one that I think is my favorite overall fingerless glove pattern. And I'm going to be making this pair for myself because I have a brown coat and I need a pair of fingerless gloves right now. So this is a gift for myself. Don't forget yourself when it comes to making. You deserve a gift as well. And I'm going to bring this up a little bit closer to show you what I'm making it out of. This is my hand spun yarn. And I call this yarn, I made this back in, I don't know, I think it was 2022. I have it on my project notes. But Carolyn and I, my good friend Carolyn, this is one of the first times we got together to spin out in the park. She and I had our old wooden wheels at that time. Uh, I brought along my grandmother's Ashford Traddy wheel and she had her Ashford Traveler wheel. And we took, actually took a drum carter out to the park, put it on the picnic bench or the picnic table in our favorite park near my home. And we set up the drum carter with all kinds of brown natural fiber as well as some colored fiber. And we had shades that looks like of green, yellow, pink, uh, even a little bit of purple here, and copper. And we just put those beautiful little uh, add-ins into our drum carter and made our bats. Then we spun them. And I called this yarn Autumn in the Park. And I wrote down that I did long draw. And it was from Shetland. I forgot about, see, if I hadn't made a note of it, I wouldn't remember. But I made this, the brown of it is Shetland. And then many slubs and many uh, add-ins add into the drum carter. These were literally just as you're doing drum carding, these were ones that I had left over from other projects, other little bits and bobs of fiber. So that's one of my favorite things to do with that added, you know, little threads and fiber is to put them into the bat as I'm doing it. So this is, uh, this is a carded uh, yarn, and so it's very fluffy and soft. It makes wonderful fingerless gloves. It would also make a wonderful hat. And this that I have in my hand right now is about 100 yards of, of the fiber, uh, of the yarn, hand spun. And I am making, the other one is 
the one I've just started here. I have a feeling I'm going to easily be able to make my fingerless gloves out of one of these skeins, and I might have enough with the second to make a small hat or something else, another accessory. Or I could make two sets of fingerless gloves is another possibility. But I absolutely love this yarn. It's very natural looking, so I'm going to be able to wear it with my brown coat. But it also has those little bits of interest thrown in, the little flecks of color that always appeal to me. And I hope to you as well. One other thing I'm going to show you is, uh, for those of you who are not knitters, you are crocheter. There's another fingerless glove pattern that I would highly recommend. I'm going to come up closer. This is another freebie. This is from Cherry Heart, is what she goes by. She normally does a lot of um, Afghan patterns and things like that uh, online, Afghan projects. But this particular one is made from just leftover stripy yarn or minis. And again, I chose to use little different uh, buttons that I, again, got from my grandmother's ferns button collection that she gave me. And so I really like using different buttons. I don't like having them all the same myself. But if you're a person, you could make, you like more of a unicolor look, you could make all of this out of one color, or you could use it for your little leftovers like I did. And you can either use buttons of the same kind or different like this. But I love the way this works. It's really a fun little um, pattern. And it goes either way, like these, these mitts, I've lost the second one actually, it's in the trunk of my car, I hope it's in the trunk of my car if I didn't lose it, but this is the one mitt, but they both are made the same, so you uh, can easily, you know, there's not like a left and a right, but this is extremely easy, so if you're a crocheter, go to the link that I'm going to have below to make a simple crocheted fingerless glove. And one more thing that I'm going to point out is that I'll have a picture of it in, Bob will put up a picture. One of the very easiest patterns, um, and I think that originally I got the uh, idea for it from back when Crazy Aunt Pearl was doing her blog. Some of you may remember her. She had a blog a long time ago. I don't think she still does it. I don't know. If any of you know, let me know. But Crazy Aunt Pearl had a wonderful little blog. And she had a free pattern um, on one of the blog entries. And what it was was just making an 8-inch rectangle. So I'm using a washcloth here to demonstrate this. But she literally just took, made a rectangle out of stockinette stitch, I believe it was. Uh, and she just made the rectangle 8 inches square. Or maybe if you want it to be longer, you can make it longer on the length. But what she did was just make the rectangle, and then there wasn't a separate gusset. You literally just took, after you knit the rectangle or crocheted it, you just sewed up to where your thumb would start, like right here. And then you, would, you can put your thumb through, mark it with a pen so you know where it would go, and then just sew up a little bit here at the top. And so literally any rectangle would do to make, a fingerless glove, and if that is truly the easiest fingerless glove ever. Hi everyone, I wanted to make another quick point that I think is important, especially for newer knitters or crocheters. Um, this is an example of a mitt where it does not have what they call a gusset. It is literally just a hole that is made to accommodate the thumb. So this is one where you do not have a gusset. You just have a naked thumb sticking out. And that's okay for a simpler version of a fingerless glove that works very well. But I want to show you on the main morning mitts, the one that I'm currently making and that I am going to have a link for you, this one does have what we call a gusset, a thumb gusset. And so just like you have a, in socks, you have a gusset to accommodate the heel. Well, in a, fingerless glove gusset like this one, you have an extra little triangle shape that is going to accommodate the thumb. And it, it's eventually going to cover part of the thumb and keep it warm. Uh, but with, on the pattern, when you get to row 9 of the main morning mitts, you're going to want to 
what she's wanting you to do is to put nine stitches on a separate needle. And these will be on hold as you fin continue making the rest of the mitt. You're going to knit the mitt up as far as you want. Probably for me, it'll be mid-knuckle. And then when I go back, I can return to this little extra needle, and I can then pick up those stitches, pick up around the edges here, and knit up again to about the knuckle area. And so that way my thumb will be covered. Thanks, everybody. The next thing I have just started, and I'm only one disc in, I think there's a total of seven discs. This is a CD set I got from the library. But I'm getting ready to move into my Christmas reading. Every year around now, uh, from at least by Thanksgiving, if not sooner, I like to start reading some Christmas reads that really help get me in the Christmas spirit. And uh, one of those that I found, and I think I'm going to really enjoy it, I am so far, is called Mr. Dickens and His Carol. And this is by Samantha Silva. And so um, the book is, you know, based on his writing of the Christmas Carol. And so far from what I've been able to check out on Wikipedia and learn a little bit more about his life, it seems fairly true to form. But basically... Um, it's just, you know, talking about how he went about writing the book and different things, and it's a fictionalized version of how he came upon several of the revelations, you know, about Christmas past and Christmas present and Christmas future. And from what I'm understanding, as the book opens, his wife has just given birth to their sixth child, and he has had a little uh, spat of his numbers being down on his sales, book sales, and so uh, his editor is trying to push him into writing a Christmas story. And he feels really put upon and pretty uh, irritated by it. But, you know, it's apparently they were pushing him into writing a Christmas story. So he did end up, obviously, writing A Christmas Carol. And it's one of the most popular uh, books of, of Christmas, I believe, of all time. And it's extreme. So once again, I want to... Uh, Thank you for showing up today and joining me for a little bit of chatter about all of our fiber uh, activities. And I hope that you will tell me in the comments about what it is you're doing now and are you making Christmas gifts or are you working on something else? Um, are you planning on making any sweaters this winter? Um, until next time, remember, love what you're making and wear what you make. Bye now.